Um, I want to share something this morning that, uh, not to alarm you, not to frighten you, but obviously to prepare you. Uh, that's what I endeavor to do as a pastor. And uh, so before I get into my message, I just want to set the scene for that. I, I do talk to a lot of people, and some people you know, tell me that they're too busy for church, too busy for God, basically. Uh, maybe you know, they've got whether it's holiday places or just work or whatever, you know, and they, they just can't get along. I often say if you're too busy uh, for God, you're too busy, right? We need to make time. It should be our priority uh, to, to give God some time. Uh, but the other thing is that to some degree, the devil doesn't really care how busy you are as how effective you are that he cares about, how fruitful you are. I mentioned in the earlier service, since, since we have got back together, which has only been a month, you may not believe it, um, but we've had just over 500 people, individuals, faces, decide for Jesus across the Auckland campuses. There's children and adults, holiday club and, and all. And, and uh, you know, there's a lot of people. That's, that's like a statistic, but it's people. It's, it's, it's husbands, wives, mothers, daughters. I mean, it's all kinds of people giving their lives to Christ. Amen. And so the devil doesn't like it when you're fruitful. And I don't know whether you realize it or not, but the church in New Zealand is coming under attack as never before. Um, things are being said. And, and to be honest, churches, unless you're a little church on the corner and not a threat to anybody, uh, churches who are fruitful are not very popular necessarily out there in society. And neither, of course, uh, uh, committed Christians. But City Impact Church, also we have in the past few weeks given about 100K, $100,000 that is, over to the Ukraine area. I've been in contact. In fact, I was just emailing this morning Pastor Slavavia. Uh, I don't pronounce his name right, but he's in Belarus. They lost their building. They're meeting on the street. Large church, about, about 7,000 people. Pastor Matt's in Russia. Large church. I preach here. 10,000 people in Moscow. Uh, churches in, in, in Ukraine uh, that we're in partnership with through Pastor Joachim and, and so forth. And so we have sent aid over to the Christians. And I'm praying daily, and I trust you are as well, uh, for churches and Christians in those areas right now. Because it's not easy. You and I live in a beautiful country. We're down under. We haven't got the problems of the world. We know that. But that does not excuse us from our responsibility. Amen. And so we also, by the way, continue to feed hundreds of people here at City Impact Church, be it down south or out west or here, uh, because there are people with needs right now. And we give out hundreds of meals, and that's because you wonderful people cook and deliver the meals and so forth. And I just want to give you a big rap this morning and say, uh, well done, City Impact Church, because we are continuing, not just because of lockdown, but we are continuing because there is a lot of poverty beginning to happen in New Zealand. Amen. So in relation to the church being attacked, I'm going to speak more about it on Wednesday night at Equip, go into a couple of details that I know about. But it is, I want to make it very clear, I've said it over the years, that nobody, nobody has the authority to pull down the church. We only have the authority to build the church. Can I hear an amen to that? In fact, it is true. There is the accuser of the brethren, and everybody knows it is the devil, right? He's the accuser of the brethren. And you don't want to give yourself to the devil's work. It's easy to find fault with things, easy to find fault with the church, easy to find fault with me. Hello, who ate too much chocolate over Easter? I'll go first. So the thing is, it's easy to find fault, but the devil is a fault finder. And I don't want to do the devil's work. We are here to encourage people, to build up people, amen. And so I'm going to be speaking more, as I said, about that and that at Equip, and that's open to all the workers, which is pretty much everybody, because we have great volunteers at City Impact Church. But many of us, particularly as I come into this next season of my life, we just want to live a kind of a, like a quiet, normal life. What is normal today, I pray tell? I mean, that, you know, to go back to the way things are, but hands up those who know we're not going back. The world is not going back. It's marching on at a rapid rate as I will talk about some things again this morning. And I'm glad I got the young people here not to in any way put fear into you, but to put faith into you for you are born for such a time as this. This is a world that God has got you alive in for this hour. Amen. And so 
I don't really know what goes on in the corridors of power. I'd love to know sometimes whether it's the powers of the White House, even our beehive. You know, what goes on behind closed doors? What deals are being made? What, what things are being said? And, you know, as you know, there are governments that are manipulated by the powers to be. There's all kinds of things that happen. And I don't know really what goes on, but I do know that little old New Zealand, we are to some degree far removed, we think we are, from the problems of the world. And much of the world is at war right now. I mean, all of you, of course, know about the war in Ukraine, but that is not the only country with conflict right now. If you know anything about the world and know about, you know, whether South America or whatever, uh, and South Africa, not South Africa, but Africa as well. And uh, obviously much isn't in our mainstream news, but if you go a little bit further afield, it's not hard to see. And as people, as Christians, we should be concerned for this world. We should be concerned for the world and intent on the kingdom of God. So it behoves us not to bury our head in the sand like a lot of people, but understand the signs of the times, understand the season which we're living. The Israelites, they missed the day of their visitation. We need to lift up our heads and rejoice because I believe our redemption does draw nigh. The King, He does cometh, amen? Come on now, I need to get an amen. So as your pastor for about 40 years now, I've been... I think pretty open and uh, sharing things that I see here, whatever, sharing them out of the Word of God to keep you informed and endeavoring to preach the whole gospel. I know some things aren't culturally relevant today, but this book changes not. And I, I will stand here and defend this book. Amen. I know a lot of people don't like what's in this book, but I need to talk about some things. I want to go to Jude. Jude, it's only one chapter. I love the book of Jude. It's right before the book of Revelation. It's the last day's book. But he prophesies about some things. Jude, now remember Jude was a stepbrother of Jesus. Why why do I say a stepbrother? Because he was a son of Mary, but Jude was a son of Joseph, Mary's husband. Jesus, his father was God, right? Amen. So Jude and James, who he mentions here, were stepbrothers of Christ. They did not believe in Jesus until He rose again from the grave. That's one of the greatest um, reasons and, and evidences that Jesus did raise. These two men, they got martyred for their faith in Christ, but they didn't believe in Christ until He rose from the grave because familiarity breeds contempt. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, To those who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love. Look at it, be multiplied to you. Mercy, peace, and love. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. Now you and I know, we may not agree on everything. I mean, some people don't agree with what I say, whether it's on social media or, or, or even whatever. But we've got a common salvation. And His name is Jim. We shouldn't let anything divide us because it's Jesus that unifies us. Amen. And so we've got this comment for salvation. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly. We've got to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once all delivered to the saints. As Sodom and Gomorrah, we all know what those two cities mean, and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire, a heavy duty. Likewise, I mean, heaven is real, hell as well. Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Now, I'm glad I got the young people here, and I'm not sure who I'm speaking to this morning, but I hear sadly that some youth in the church as Christians have brought into the spur of the world and are listing their preferred pronouns on their social media platform. Now, I know I was brought up in a different era, but this Bible is still correct. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Male and female, He created them. Now, the world is getting very messed up. I don't have to tell you that. I don't want to get too caught up into it today. But I'm going to be speaking on on a post about it. And by the way, Bob McCossie's got some great clips on Family First. But kids are being taught. Kids are being taught in the United States in kindergarten. And it's coming in here. And they're being taught in our school that your mum and dad might have said you're a girl and a boy, but they might have made a mistake. They might have made a mistake. What do you want to be? And this is the education. Now, we can bury our head in the sand and pretend it's not happening. But it's happening at a rapid race of knots. 
I was listening to one, a couple of girls that had been through this process and uh, of becoming boys and so, and they've gone back, they got converted, which is actually a crime today, conversion therapy. But, but the thing is, as they were saying, that on social media now, if you don't like the sound of your voice on recording, anybody out there like the sound of their voice on recording? I hate listening to myself on recording. That you are probably transsexual. I mean, you know, there's a, a huge net to gather in our young people. We've got to protect our young people from the garbage that's coming down through these corridors. And so, I don't want to talk too much about that, but it says that they are clouds. Everybody say clouds. Clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees. This is Jude prophesying about the clouds. Without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming in their own chain, wandering stars, for whom is reserved the blackness and darkness forever. And by the way, can I just say to the young people, I understand some of the pressure they're under of their peers and school and universities. It's not easy for them today. I grew up in a different era, obviously, but I do want to understand them and help them and get them to hold fast to this Word of God. Now it says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, the seventh from Adam, Enoch, he was the one who walked with God and was no more, prophesied, he prophesied about these men saying, behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict those who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way and all harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. It's pretty heavy duty. These are grumblers, complainers, waiting, walking according to their own lust, and with their mouth, great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before, uh, which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual person, people who cause divisions, not having the spirit. But you, beloved, and I pray that every person here under the sound of my voice today would build yourself up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some have compassion, making a difference, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now, everybody here probably has heard of a, a gentleman by the name of George Orwell. He is famous for his, in his 1984 novel in which he listed six things, six things. Totalitarianism, he saw that coming into the world. Total control, pure power. The next one was propaganda machines. Then a thing called love. Liberty and censorship. Language, news speak, and then technology, all seeing telescreens, having a watchful eye on society. That's what he prophesied. Huxley, 1932 novel. I read it before I was a Christian, A Brave New World. Photo of him on the screen. He had three main things that he saw happening. No privacy, no family, no monogamy. And he said at the start, it made clear that everybody belongs to everyone else. In other words, you lose your individuality, the identity. Citizens, he said, will wear eye plants that record and follow their every move. One of the sobering messages of Huxley Brave New World is the alarm raised by him about the dangers of technology using scientific and technological advantages to control society, which will give power to totalitarianism, states to change the way humans think and act. You've heard also probably of H.G. Wells. He was born in 1866 a science fiction writer. He envisioned an utopian government which would ensure every individual would be as well-aged as possible, particularly in science. In other words, believe the science. Now, these three men, as far as I can Google, were not Christians. They did not believe in God. In fact, they were communistic. They were socialist and agnostic. Now, in the Bible, we have godly men inspired by the Holy Ghost. We've got Old Testament writers like Daniel, Isaiah, even Enoch, the seventh from Adam. We've got New Testament writers like Jude that are just predicting what the world will be like. Paul described the last generation in 2 Timothy chapter 3 down to a T, 
John on the island of Patmos in the book of Revelation, everybody here would know about it, about the totalitarian antichrist system that would come in, give everybody a mark that without that 666 mark, you would not be able to buy or sell or function in society. Now, these ungodly writers like the likes of H.G. Wells and Huxley and Orwells, they lived in a day, listen to me, they lived in a day when they did not have the means to fulfill their dreams, or should I say nightmares. They live way beyond. I mean, I've, I've been to Cape Canaveral, and I've seen the, 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 the um, capsules that they came down from the moon in. Those capsules have got dials in them. Dials. Turn knobs. No, hardly a, a computer in sight. They say there's more computer, um, not a, whatever it is called, bytes and type bytes and more, more computer energy in a, in a handheld computer, uh, sorry, a handheld um, calculator today than what's in those rocket ships that brought man back down from the moon. The world has advanced so much since the 1960s. And so back then, these men who lived before that did not have the means or didn't have the knowledge or the understanding of what we have today. Now, today we've got the likes of an Israeli professor by the name of Yuval Noah Hari. Uh, 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 yeah, comes up on the screen. He wrote a book, some of you may have read it, I don't know, but uh, called Sapiens is a Brief History of Humankind. Apparently, it's got a few flaws in it. But then he wrote another book, Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. Interesting, he was educated at a college called Jesus College, but he's far from a Christian. In his audience sits presidents, politicians, and powerful and rich people. So he's talking to some very powerful people. He's a gay married man, and he calls his husband his internet of all things. His first book, as I said, is about history. His next book is about the future. He talks about humans becoming hackable. You may sound a, a bit far-fetched, but you all would have heard of algorithms. And you know, and I know, when you Google things on your computer or iPhone, whether it's movies you watch or clothes you buy, next things, ads come in and so forth. Many people have got Apple Watches and all that kind of stuff and da data is stored. And he was saying that people will give away their health details, what's happening on the inside of them for the well-being of society and the well-being of the health. And you and I know we've just been through or still going through uh, this, this pandemic of sorts. And so this has already happened to some degree. But what he was talking about is this technology is coming in like a freight train. He said, there's no going back. Nobody can stop it. He was warning to some degree of the dangers because if all the data gets owned by one country, by the wrong person, then obviously it becomes a dictator because they govern people. And so he was talking about things like being gay. He said, if I lived in Iran, for example, or some other country where um, uh, you know, uh, homosexuals are taken out and shot, and as a 14-year-old boy, I've got to start to get these feelings those algorithms would be picked up by whoever. And as he said, you won't be able to hide from Alibaba, Amazon, or the secret police. And so he talked about if there's a photo of a dictator on the wall and you walk into that room and you've got a feeling about that dictator, that will be picked up by algorithm. Now that might sound pretty far-fetched, but technology, and he knows what he's talking about, technology is going at a rate that way is beyond my understanding and so he talked about being controlled by AI, artificial intelligence. And he said this statement, which picked up my ears before I get to what I'm preaching on today. I'm laying a scene. He said, we will no longer believe in the God above the clouds, but this will be replaced with the God in the cloud. Did you just hear what I said? Now that can be very scary and unbelievable for some people who don't wanna know about it. If he wasn't such a listen to speaker from the point of view of the World Economic Forum agenda that by 2030 you'll own nothing and be happy, another socialist as it were, and we may live down under, but I know probably like me, some of you have read the World Economic Forum paper in New Zealand on artificial intelligence and it comes up on the screen and it's a paper that's here to uh, let us know that we are one of these forerunners. So we may not be able to bury our head in the sand for too much longer. So let me get to go where I'm going this morning because I want to give you hope and faith that in amongst all of this, 
there is, I believe as Christians, we can make a difference. Jude 22, on some have compassion, making a difference. And you and I are called to live in this world, which is strange from the one I grew up in, I understand that. But you and I are called there, particularly young people, to make a difference today. We're born for such a time as this. Now, let me just say this, and you know it and I know it, that life does not just improve with time alone. In fact, look at the, look at the human body. But you know, a house that is built and not lived in will deteriorate. A car that is built and not driven will deteriorate. Engines need to tick over. Doors need to be open and shut, right? And a lot of people think things just get better time in time. This world will get better in time. That's what evolution teaches you. And evolution is an outdated theory. DNA proves that quite clearly, but they hold on to it. And so the opposite, in fact, is true that things deteriorate, particularly when they're left alone. And things can only get better as we put our hands to the plow, as we get a bigger vision, a kingdom vision, and as we begin to look outward and upward, take our eyes off ourselves and look unto Jesus. In other words, let's change our focus. Now, you know and I know that God is a creator of heaven and earth, and He created a very colorful world. We live in a beautiful country. You don't have to travel to the other side of the world to see how beautiful this world is. The beaches, the mountains, the valleys, the flowers, all that kind of stuff. And in Genesis 1, God said it was good. Then he created man on the sixth day, man, you and I, and God declared that man was very good, very good. Not just good, but very good. Why? Because God breathed into him and he said, I've made Man in my own image. And so God put his creativity in the si inside of man. You know that birds just build nests, right? You know that fish just swim in the ocean. But man not only swims in the ocean, we fly in the sky. We build things. We create things. And so... God said man was very good. And not only that, he said in Genesis verse 28, he said, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful. So God put his very nature into man to carry out his purpose. And so man was created with the ability to produce, with the ability to be productive and to be creative, to tend the garden that God himself had planted to take care of paradise. Eden was paradise. Eden was utopia. Adam, as you know, made a willful decision to sin, to be disobedient. And so sin entered creation. And what was good and even very good in the eyes of God began to deteriorate. Adam, as you know, lived 930 years after the fall. God said a day unto the Lord is as a thousand years. And so he died within that day as God said he would. And death set in. And you know, and I know that in the early years, the patriarchs lived for hundreds of years, but slowly and slowly and slowly over the years, that came down to three score a year and 10. And 80 if you're lucky. Just kidding. So sin is a sucker. Sin sucks the very life out of people. And we're all born with that, like that sin virus. We're all born in sin. But praise the Lord, through Jesus, we can have a blood transfusion and we can be adopted into the kingdom of God. But just like rust that does not sleep, sin does not sleep either. Now, I want you to know, things did not just go bad overnight. The water was still good for drinking. The air was still good for breathing. That was 6,000 years ago since the fall of man. But hands up those who know that things are changing rapidly and today deteriorating at a rapid rate. I won't talk about climate change and things that are happening in the world, but you know and I know that the, the planet is deteriorating. Today we have bottled water because the water has to be boiled in many countries. Growing up, even 50 years ago, 70 years ago, and counting. I would never have dreamed. I can remember seeing bottled water on the supermarket shelf for the first time and laughing, literally laughing. Who would buy that? My wife. <laughs> I mean, here, have you seen the smog in places like China? How'd you like to be in China right now? Do you know the surveillance that goes on in those countries? And so New Zealand, again, living down under, 
City Impact Church, like we live in a country that's supposedly clean and green. But society at large on the planet is not breaking through like we're supposed to do. They're breaking down. Now you read the paper. You read the paper and watch the news, I'm sure. And so even when I was growing up, we had one murder a year. I can name them. It was like big news, news for the whole year. Now they don't even report murders. Shootings are a dime a dozen today. You got seven-year-olds just in the paper this week, seven-year-olds, 12-year-olds, ram raiding shops, driving through shopping malls. I mean, the world is deteriorating very quickly. I, I need, we need to wake up and understand the times in which we live, church. Not be ignorant of them. We don't, for people who say, well, I don't want to know, I don't want to know, I don't want to know. We need to know because you and I are called to make a difference in this world. We're called to have compassion on people. You know, in my day, if you were a shoplifter, <laughs> you'd go to jail. So we see in the Bible where the internal corruption started to outwork in man's environment, and it's been working for the past 6,000 years. In Genesis 4, just one chapter after, you had the first murder on the planet, but how many murders are happening around the world today, let alone in New Zealand? So just because man was sinful, that did not mean to say that he lost his creativity. It's just that he'd, it's been corrupted. So Cain was expelled from the presence of God. He was a murderer. He was given a mark, which is interesting. But he went on to build a city, and he be, man became obsessed with self. And so man became self-centered, self-serving, selfish, self-conscious, absorbed with self-esteem. In other words, man was navel-gazing, looking inward, all concerned about number one, about themselves. And so in Genesis 4, you see them trying to build a city, trying to get back to Eden, trying to get back to Utopia, to paradise. What they'd lost, they tried to regain, and they tried to build a substitute. See, man still had his productivity. Man still had his creativity and his ability and giftings to design and to build. And so you see in that chapter, they had buildings, they had music, they had tools. But then in Genesis 11, now listen to me, we see man trying to reach the clouds. We see man trying to reach the clouds, trying to reach heaven, building the Tower of Babel. And the amazing thing was, was God didn't scoff at the idea. He said, look, if they can think about it, if they can dream it, if they can, if they can work together in unity, they can achieve that. Nothing shall be impossible to them. Now, let's go to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. This is New Testament. Are you with me today? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because what may be, known, what may be made known by God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. Look at this. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. In other words, the heavens display the glory of God. I don't think there's a person on the planet who at some time doesn't look up at the starry sky and think, what's it all about? Where did I come from? Where am I going to? Now, I know a lot of people want to suppress that because the question is too big, although it can be answered in Jesus. Hallelujah. But the thing is, is that the heavens display the glory of God. And it says here, look at it, look at it. It says, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Everybody's without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but become futile on their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they become fools and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. Did I tell you that, that guy that Jewish philosopher, he's calling the God in the clouds, in the cloud, intelligent design. He's saying humanity as we know it won't exist in maybe 200 years because we'll be part machine, part man. But for birds and four-footed animals, that's out there, of course. Four-footed animals and creeping things. But you know, the devil's always out to change, you know, what God originally created. You know, and I know that God destroyed when, when the, when the uh, fallen angels came and cohabited with man, uh, with woman, sorry. And there's a new breed and God de destroyed them all. 
birds and four-footed animals and creeping. Therefore God gave them over to uncleanliness and the lust of the hearts to dishonour their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie, worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to their vile passions. Talks about, obviously, the sexual thing that's happening today that I've alluded to, and I don't have to go on to it, but enough to say that the Bible prophesied it here, things would happen. And this whole trans, you know, the LGBT thing is right here in the, in the Bible. Then it goes on down to, uh, talks about murders, strife, evil mindedness, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters. In verse 30, look at it, look at it in verse 30. Inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. And it talks about other things there that we could uh, uh, list. So as things have gone over time, we see the human race on the planet has deteriorated. No two ways about that. No wonder the whole of creation longs and groans for the manifestation of the sons of God. I'm believing before Jesus comes back that the sons of God, the bride of Christ, will be manifested. And the whole of creation that's out of whack right now, the storms, and we could talk about things of nature, is groaning and longing for the manifestation of the sons of God. So we see the human race now inventors of evil things. The Bible prophesied it. So let's talk about nuclear. As you know right now, many would say we've got a um, tyrant in Russia who's got more nuclear power than, than most countries with his finger on the trigger. You've got in the United States, you've got President Joe Biden, who if you've seen some of the clips, you know, struggles to remember things at times and know where he's at. And he's got his finger on the button. I mean, these are dangerous times, nuclear war. Now, John, uh, Mr. Rutherford, was this Robert, Ru Robert Rutherford? Ernest Rutherford, a New Zealander, was the first man to split the atom. And it was a good thing. It was science. It was, was, was evolving into a good thing. But what was intended for good is now a weapon of mass destruction. And so inventors of evil things. We think about drugs. Drugs have been created for good. Who would like to go into the theater without any anesthetic? I tell you, it wasn't that long ago. You look at the war, for example, the Civil War in America, and they would saw the leg off without any anesthetic. Give them a, a, you know, a, a half a bottle of rum, I suppose. I'd take the rum. And, I don't drink, but I'd take the rum. <laughs> All right. Um, um, so drugs intended for good, but now we have drug abuse. People get enslaved with that. Addicted to that, ruins people's lives. P is ruining people's lives. And so children, children are a gift from God. But today we have child abuse as never before. Sex was meant for good, but now we've got sex abuse. And they say every child on the planet who's got with these iPhones and iPads and computers are now open to pornography, which is an addictive thing. And so instead of giving, we take now. So in, in the beginning, Genesis 1, when God created the heavens and the earth, He was known as Jehovah Elohim, basically the Lord, our Creator. He is our Creator. But when sin entered the world, God, who was Jehovah Elohim, our Creator, had to reveal Himself further to us. And so He revealed Himself as Jehovah Gal. You know that I've taken you through this. The Lord, our nearest kinsman. The Lord, our nearest kinsman. Friend, I'm here to tell you that God is your Redeemer. He purchased you back. He paid the price for your sin and my sin. We could not earn it. We could not pay enough. We could not be good enough. Jesus died for our sin. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And if you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, your sin is washed away and removed as far as you. It's the only thing that will save you. And so He became our nearest kinsman, our Redeemer. See, man didn't need redeeming when he was in the garden. He was in paradise in utopia, but now man was lost, separated from his maker. So God came up with a plan, a redemption plan to buy us back. God had his eye focused on restoration, not destruction. The, world's got, the world is focused a little bit on destruction right now. Redemption is to take back that which is broken and fix it, to restore it to its original purpose, our relationship with the heavenly maker. And then God had to continue to reveal other attributes of His character to us to meet our need. Jehovah Jireh, our provider, again in the garden, we lack nothing. Do you know in heaven you'll lack nothing? 
There's no more buying and selling. There's no more crying, no more dying, no more sickness. In heaven, you'll lack nothing. In paradise, in utopia, you will lack nothing. But of course, here when man sinned, he needed to know God as Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Now how will we get on, church, if the mark comes in and you can't buy and sell? I'm here to tell you, hallelujah, you need not be in fear. God is our provider. I mean, we've seen how it can happen just recently. People can't go to certain places. It's so easy to bring in something like that. Man lacked nothing in the garden. So man didn't need provision in the garden, but he needed provision. Jehovah Rapha, our healer. Again, man was never sick in the garden. But sin causes sickness and disease. Jehovah Adonah, the Lord, our teacher. Do you know in the garden, Adam... <laughs> Created in the image of God, he worked on 10 tenths of his brain. Science tells us that we only work on one tenth, maybe two when we pray or meditate. But Adam worked on 10 tenths. He named all the animals. He was a brilliant person. But now man needed educating. <laughs> so he became the Lord, our teacher. Jehovah Magdasha, the Lord, our sanctification. Not pronouncing it properly. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, our peace. You know, it's just down in Queenstown, as you know. With Pastor Lynn losing uh, her husband, Paul, what a wonderful man and brother he was. Walking a track, he was as fit, as healthy as anyone. Just dropped dead at 61 years of age of a heart attack. You never know when your day's up. And you know, the family, I went round to the family, of course, and so forth. And they had such a peace because they're such a godly family. Things like that can destroy people. Jehovah Elon, the Lord Most High, the owner of it all. You know, I love and I, I pray so often, Lord, the nations are about to drop in the bucket. Can we get a God perspective? The nations are about to drop in the Ukraine and Russia and the United States and England, France, Jim, the New Zealand, it's all just a drop in the bucket to our God. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Every sparrow that falls from the ground, he sees. He calculates the dust of the earth. He numbers a grain of sand on the sea. I believe it. If you look at creation, it's not impossible to believe how wonderful our God is. He, the hair upon a head, He's numbered. He named the stars and He calls them out one by one. And so, hallelujah, He's the owner of it all. This whole world is His in the fullness thereof. And then I love how God just sums it up in Exodus 3. I am who I am, Yahweh. I will be what I will be. Oh, come on now. We're talking about Jehovah, the Lord, our God. You got no reason to be afraid. The world's got a lot of reasons to be afraid. You got no reason to be in fear or, or worried when you're in Christ. Hallelujah. God provided what man needed to restore man back to paradise, back to utopia. Man's trying to find it. They're trying to find it now still. I just... Showed you a couple of things that's happening in the world today. And man is trying to find, that, find it, but you can only find it with a relationship in Jesus. Acts 3.19. Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come. Times of refreshing. Where do they come from? From the presence of the Lord that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you. Oh, I wish we could just go back to normality. You know, we can travel without any worry about poor David Wynn when the service before they went to England and uh, they were in England and they caught COVID and they got stuck there for days. And, you know, and, and, and so nothing simple today, you know that. But the thing is that I'd love just to think we can go back, but the world is moving on this freight train rapidly and you and I are on it. Because we're still alive today. Pastor Paul, thank God, he got off it. <laughs> but you and I are here and we're called, hallelujah, to function and make a difference, to be salt and light. And so times are refreshing. They come from the presence of the Lord. And God's got you, particularly young people, alive for such a time. This is what a privilege, what an honor it is. Times like never before that he may send Jesus Christ who has preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God spoke, look at it, by the mouth, not of H.G. Wells, nor of the other guy, Harry, and whoever it was, 
that God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets since time began. See, the only way for redemption is restoration of life through grace and faith in Jesus Christ. Through repentance from turning from sin. Not through AI and not through a God in the cloud. Man wants utopia. Man wants to be like God. That was the original sin in the garden. Eat this, Adam, or eat this, Eve, and you will be like God. You've got to love God's focus on redemption, restoration, not destruction. War is so destructive. You've seen the pictures, the images. But the control of man, he's given every man a free will. And that guy I spoke about, that professor, he's saying man will lose his free will for the benefit of society, for the benefit of mankind. You've already heard that talk. So choose this day. We've got a free will. You've got a free will. Every person here, every man and woman and child, you've got a free will today to choose whom you will believe. And so let me close up very quickly by saying this. The church, City Impact Church, and every church on the planet, we need to exist for three reasons and three reasons alone. Not so you can meet a boy or a girl or, you know, just go and have fun at youth group. All that can be part of it. But we're here for the glorification of God. We're here, hallelujah, to worship, to make His name known, to declare His wonder, His love, His mercy, and His grace and His glory and His compassion. So we're here for the glorification of God. We're also here for the edification of the saints. My wife will tell you, I'm often praying, oh God, build the saints, build them up. Let holy faith come upon the people of God today. Build them up in the holy faith. And so we're here for your edification, for your encouragement. And I know when I talk about some of those things, people can get fearful. I mean, it's like COVID, man, what a fear deal that was. We had no reason to fear. You got no reason to fear, church. We're in Christ, irrespective of your thoughts about it. Let's not buy into fear. Let's not buy into control. Let's buy into the freedom of Christ and the faith in Christ. And so the edifications, I want people built up, not in fear and hiding and not running off to some bunker somewhere or some mountain. Three, we're here for the evangelization of the world. Evangelization of the world. It's a big word. It's got more than seven letters. (laughs) Having dropped out of school at 15, I wouldn't even be able to spell it. I was telling a spelling test with my granddaughter the other day. I think she could spell better than me. But in any case, that's why God chose the foolish to confound the wise. I take heart that he could talk to a donkey. Hallelujah. (laughs) The evangelization of the world. I'm like a parrot. If I hear someone say it, immediately I can say it. Give me five minutes and I can't. But in any case, the evangelization of the world, the winning of souls, the making of disciples, that's what we're here for. And as I said, all those hundreds of decisions we made or seen made, I should say, since lockdown, that's why I live and breathe because I want to, hallelujah, plunder hell and populate heaven. I want to see names written in the book of life. And so let's be encouraged. Let's understand we are called to make a difference. We're called to break through. We can bring heaven to earth. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so you can have peace in the midst of tragedy. You can have joy. Hallelujah. You can live righteously in Christ. And so together we say that's why the church is so important. That's why Jesus and the church is the greatest cause on the planet. I will build my church, says Jesus. So even though people are tearing it down, people are speaking against it, and I know that there can be faults with the church, but friend, listen to me today. It's the bride of Christ. Jude finishes up by saying, Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceedingly joy. Look at it. Look at it. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and evermore. Amen.